Here is Anatoly Karlin. He's one of my very favorite speakers. He's right there. He's a uh, Russian blogger who writes about all uh, futurism, paleo, uh, psychometrics, all kinds of things. What, that's at acarlin.com. Acarlin.com. He's one of my favorite speakers. Here he is, Anatoly. I have no idea. People who boast about the IQ are losers. That's what Stephen Hawking uh, uh, said when asked uh, about his IQ. And uh, you can't really dispute that. Uh, people who boast about the IQs uh, are maybe not losers, but strange at any rate. Uh, but the problem is, though, um, is that it's reflective of, a, um, of the kind of snide and uh, dismissive attitude that um, some people might have towards uh, discussions of IQ and intelligence and uh, uh, their importance. Um, and uh, I'm going to be making the contrary argument here. I'm going to be looking at history. I'm going to be making the case that uh, uh, intelligence and various forms of intelligence, um, uh, they've been critical to world progress, in particular world technological progress and uh, that, um, if anything, its uh, influence on uh, um, hugely significant uh, things such as the uh, global wealth and poverty are, if anything, uh, increasing. Uh, that said, there's uh, two preliminary things I want to say. First, I hope uh, you guys like graphs because there'll be a whole ton of them. Uh, secondly, I'm going to... Um, uh, from the outset, uh, state that my, my, my position that um, IQ uh, and intelligence, they are real things. Uh, they are not a social construct, as, uh, as some uh, commentators uh, um, might, might say. Uh, psychometrics is an established subject, uh, which was uh, founded more than a century ago by uh, Francis Galton, who was the nephew of Charles Darwin, and uh, by Charles Spearman. Uh, there's um, a... Um, a huge uh, amount of statistical evidence uh, behind it. Uh, um, virtually all psychologists uh, um, uh, say in, in opinion polls that, that, it is, that it is a real thing and uh, uh, measures a real thing, uh, which loosely defined uh, um, means uh, the ability to perform complex mental tasks. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, it works with images, thanks. I don't need right. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, I guess. I guess it doesn't work for images, just the PowerPoint presentations. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is a, um, a uh, uh, graph of uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you see the GDP per capita uh, and purchasing power par parity terms. Uh, that's more reflective of, uh, of living standards than just GDP per capita uh, because it accounts for varying price levels in different countries. And below you have uh, the human capital um, of, of, of a particular country, uh, which I used, uh, uh, and I used here as a measure, the average of the PISA teams uh, and teams. These are international standardized uh, assessments. And um, uh, if 500 is actually the equivalent of, uh, to an IQ of, uh, of uh, 100, the sta standard deviation here is, uh, is uh, 100, so 400 would be equivalent to an IQ of 85, 600 would be, an would be equivalent to an IQ of 115. And uh, so here you have various countries uh, plot, uh, plotted uh, uh, along, along, along here, and uh, as you can see, there's a uh, pretty, pretty good correlation here uh, of, uh, of uh, 0 0.43. 0 .4 but you might valid, uh, and uh, let's go on. Yeah. Okay, okay. And uh, the next, uh, uh, the thing is, though, that this... Um, uh, correlation gets much better when you uh, only uh, count countries which have been capitalist. Uh, so uh, the the countries which are marked in red over there, uh, they are countries which have a huge amount of um, uh, oil production per capita.
at the war uh, in the, in, the, uh, in Botswana's case, diamonds, diamonds production per capita. And um, the, um, the, the Green Triangles, they're, they're countries uh, uh, that have a history of central planning. And as it turns out, that it, it turns out that um, central planning, as, as uh, most people agree, has has started to do in this economic impacts, and they are uh, on average below what would we what we would expect. But as for the others, uh, you see a, a very uh, very uh, neat uh, uh, correlation, and that correlation is in fact uh, uh, 0 0.83, and uh, that's a very solid result for, for a social scientist, for, for social scientists, scientists any correlation above 0 0.3 or so is, is considered to be a good correlation. Uh, you, still have, um, uh, you still have some uh, uh, minor outliers. Uh, the biggest one uh, to the upside is actually the, the US, where richer than, than we should be. I mean, where we're to them to, to be as rich as that. Uh, so uh, <laughs> there's um, yeah yeah here's here's the United States. There's there's different explanations for this. You, may, maybe it's because of the U.S. dollar's uh, uh, status as a reserve currency that that gives an economic advantage. Got ve has very favorable geography, a uh, truly unified market with 310 million consumers, uh, whereas the European Union uh, it's it's got. Um, it's got uh, different languages, uh, uh, still, still as a barrier, and national borders as well, despite the, the attempts to like um, may make it into one market. But but in general, it's uh, it's it's a uh, really really good fit uh, when you take away the uh, oil and resource exporters uh, who who focus on that, uh, the countries with socialist le legacies. That's uh, uh, the uh, the former Soviet uh, Union, the former Central East. Eastern Europe and uh, uh, China, which is uh, which really should be uh, higher than it is, and uh, guess what? It's growing at ten percent per per year, funnily enough, and that's uh, no doubt no accident. Despite the fact that uh, there's still a lot of uh, uh, corruption and still a lot of uh, regulations and so on, it, it seems that human capital is simply far more important. Uh, the most critical element to vote. <coughs> now, you could you could make the argument that the uh, the relationship uh, goes the other way. So, uh, as, as they say, correlation isn't causation. Uh, but um, there's um, there's two major arguments against this. Uh, first of all, uh, there's um, uh, the idea that the exception proves the rule. Uh, all, the, all the exceptions uh, to it uh, uh, have a clear explanation. They are the, uh, either the, uh, the uh, big oil exporters, which, which are artificially inflated, or the countries with, with a socialist legacy, which are artificially uh, underinflated. Uh, we can also see that it's due at the national level. This is, uh, uh, for instance, a graph by uh, four, four Italian provinces. Uh, so, like, it, it, this, this seems to apply even. Within, uh, within regions. Uh, so here, here are the exceptions. Uh, the biggest, uh, uh, like, uh, positive outlier there is, is uh, Dome Capital, and uh, I guess that would make sense because, uh, like, uh, although all the wealth not naturally gravitates to a capital city anyway. And uh, here's the second uh, uh, piece piece of the evidence. Uh, again, taking taking Italy as a uh, kind of um, microcosm of this, uh, we see that there's actually no uh, correlation really. Oh, 0 0.05. It's it's like uh, uh, doesn't matter um, between uh, the um, the uh, performance uh, uh, in, in the PISA tests and. Uh, uh, Spending on, on, on education. Oh yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, in general, of course, uh, uh, if you, if you have a country wi which is a big oil exporter, and if if, uh, if education spending uh, really um, 
led that easily to an increase in performance, then you would expect uh, uh, those uh, big oil exporters like Dubai, for instance, to, to, to be right, right up there uh, in performance on these uh, tests, but, but that isn't happening. And yeah, even even in this show, uh, you, you you also have uh, you also have this uh, correlation once you take out uh, regions uh, which are artificially uh, uh, artificially inflated, uh, thanks to uh, these awesome diamonds. Uh, why uh, might that be the case? I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on this, but I'm going to uh, mention uh, two possibilities. Uh, first of all, uh, there's um, uh, this this chart shows the typical IQ range you need for different types of job. Uh, so uh, here you've you've got uh, uh, like um, uh, assemblers, food workers, uh, uh, waitresses, which uh, cleaners, uh, uh, and uh, at, at the bottom you have professors and uh, doctors. Pretty obvious obvious uh, stuff. Uh, it's uh, it's um, uh, clear that. Uh, uh, you it's hard to make a living as a CEO or a, uh, or a uh, professional if you have an IQ of less than 115 or so. There's a certain disc of, um, of helium. A lot of stages uh, when you produce a widget, like a car or something. Uh, if uh, if one of those uh, uh, one of those parts is faulty, uh, uh, so uh, certain. Uh, Otherwise, uh, the the uh, thing the note to the speed there, uh, the probability of of uh, uh, a failure uh, on any one gadget uh, would be uh, high, and uh, as a consequence, a lot of the final products uh, would uh, so, so perhaps that uh, uh, th that it would be inefficient simply um, it, it would be more efficient to sell those resources uh, directly instead of uh, uh, trying to add, add value to them. This is a uh, and this is a map of, of the PISA uh, of the PISA scores uh, from 2009. I used uh, why why am I using PISA here? Uh, firstly, because it um, the it, it's um, a standardized international survey. It's carried out every uh, three years. It's highly regarded, uh, and they try to make it as culture neutral as possible. And uh, it um, it loads it loads heavily on on, on G, uh, so it uh, correlates well with IQ tests. But unlike with IQ tests, uh, you, you don't really have standardized uh, uh, programs which, which test IQ. So uh, it's, it's um, probably more efficient to rely on, on PISA and certainly uh, less uh, uh, open to criticism uh, from uh, the point of view that, say, some IQ test might, might, not, might uh, uh, be different in one country uh, um, from one country to another because main point of it is that it's standardized and allows these sorts of comparisons. Yes. Yes, they don't, uh, uh, they don't have uh, 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 those, those measurements, but uh, um, f extrapolating from the IQ tests, uh, uh, they would be deep bad like India. Okay. And this has con consequences. If, if uh, as I have argued, it is true that uh, that intelligence uh, is is so important for econo economic growth, uh, then uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, some countries would have brighter prospects than others. In particular, for instance, BRICS uh, is often uh, uh, advanced as one group. Uh, so uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But in reality, as, as we see there, 
uh, the uh, average IQ as uh, derived from, from the PISA tests. Uh, it's uh, actually really high in China, and uh, it's uh, moderately high in, in Russia, or at least to the than it is to the developing countries. But it's uh, considerably lower in Brazil and very much lower than India. So a practical uh, conclusion uh, you could draw from that and use it to build economic forecasts and, and uh, ideas on where to invest and so on uh, is, uh, is that uh, China and Russia probably have better medium and long-term prospects uh, for economic development and convergence with the developed world than, uh, than do Brazil and India. And there's, there's, there's uh, practical evidence for that as well. As I pointed out, uh, China is, uh, cons has been consistently growing at 10% per year ever since it uh, 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 cast aside uh, uh, the Mayoist system of economic development, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas uh, Brazil uh, has been pretty much standing, standing in place. India has been advancing a bit, but it's from an extremely low base. Oh, yeah, and uh, this is um, one criticism of, of China uh, in these PISA tests, as some of you who follow this might have heard, is that uh, uh, they only officially uh, release the results from Shanghai. And uh, some people take it to mean that it's artificially inflated because uh, all of the brightest people in China flock to Shanghai and they have the best schools and so forth. And to an extent that's true. Uh, the PISA derived IQ in Shanghai is 112. But uh, the thing is they've um, They've also leaked uh, results from some other provinces. They actually only released the results from Shanghai, but there were actually 12 other uh, provinces which, which participated in that study. And uh, I, I actually uh, found this data on the internet, and uh, uh, it, um, the average IQ, piece of derived IQ for China is, is uh, 103. So still uh, very impressive. Now, uh, why it's, uh, intelligence, uh, the wealth and poverty of nations today, but now I'm also going to examine uh, what kind of effect it has had historically. Now, one problem is that there's uh, no Uh, 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 is a necessary stepping stone to, uh, to develop human accomplishments in, in literature and science. And uh, because uh, when you're illiterate, uh, first of all, your cognitive processes uh, are different. So as uh, one, one researcher uh, said, uh, who was uh, investigating uh, differences in the thought processes of literate and illiterate peoples, taking Soviet Central Asia in the 1920s as an example, uh, he found that uh, uh, it also changes her or his cognition to a certain extent. This study shows that education has a fundamental effect on the formation of cognitive processes. The researchers found out that illiterate respondents, unlike literate ones, preferred concrete names for colors to abstract ones and situative groups of items to categorical items. Furthermore, illiterate respondents could not solve syllogistic problems like the following one. Precious metals do not get rust. Gold is a precious metal. Can gold get rust or not? These syllogistic problems did not make any sense to literate respondents because they were out of the sphere of their practical experience. Literate respondents who had at least minimal formal education solved the suggested syllogistic problems easily. Therefore, literate workers, soldiers, inventors, and so on turn out to be more effective than illiterate ones, not only due to their ability to read instructions, manuals, and textbooks, 
but also because of the de developed skill, uh, skills of abstract thinking. So uh, from this point on in my historical investigation, I'm now switching from intelligence, which we can now measure directly. We can no longer measure it, but we are going to use this rates as a function. Now, the research, uh, researcher, and uh, he uh, made uh, some there's a data gathering. He gathered data on the amount of uh, uh, manuscript books uh, published annually from the 16th to 15th centuries. As you can see, uh, during the, 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 nation, the, the Renaissance in the 14th and 15th century, uh, Italy and the Netherlands were uh, pretty much ahead of the, of the rest of Europe. In consequent centuries, as the printing press took off, uh, other uh, countries came to the forefront. And we can see that, uh, in particular, uh, the amount of books per capita. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the amount of books per capita in uh, Great uh, Britain increased uh, greatly in comparison to, to those of other countries and places like Italy, for instance, you can see fell behind and uh, uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Great Britain uh, forged ahead, uh, as, as you can see the, the Protestant countries. This was uh, a result of uh, uh, the Protestant insistence on reading the Bible for oneself. And uh, uh, using that data, he, uh, Van Zanden, compiled uh, a series of estimates on uh, relative uh, literacy rates uh, in uh, uh, these various European countries. So as we can see, uh, the highest literacy rates around uh, uh, the late 16th century, uh, that's uh, the, the, na the naissance, uh, were in Italy and the Netherlands, uh, whereas the other countries were pretty, pretty minor. Whereas by the 19th century, uh, this uh, the, this was most advanced, and uh, Great Britain had had advanced greatly. In particular, uh, so had Germany, so had Sweden, uh, from from practically zero. <coughs> you can see the effects of the Protestant Revolution outlined in the Protestant emphasis on reading the Bible for oneself. And here's, uh, here's a, uh, um, a graph for England in particular. As you can see, by even by the mid-17th century, um, uh, half of uh, English men were literate. That's uh, amazingly high for a free industrial society. And uh, what's more, there were very significant differences uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in England and the advanced countries of, of Europe in general by the 17th, 18th century uh, relative to previous civilizations. Uh, there's uh, one way of estimating this is that uh, people who are illiterate, they tend to, uh, when asked for, for their age, they tend to say that they are, oh, I'm 40 years old, I'm 50 years old. They give it in multiples of five. They don't keep good track of the actual age. Uh, that's a symptom of enumeracy. And uh, based on the fraction of uh, people who, but, but in reality only 20% of people should, should actually have an age which is a multiple of five. And by calculating the difference between the number of people who say that the, the age is a multiple of five and, uh, 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 and what it should be 20%, you can uh, uh, get an estimate of the, of the, uh, of the illiteracy date. And even in advanced uh, antique civilizations such as Rome, among rich people, urban rich people, uh, the literacy rate was 50%. Whereas by 1790, uh, even among the poor of, of England in a uh, coffer castle, let's say, a small town, uh, it was uh, uh, about 10%. So it's uh, a uh, vast, vast shift in, in, uh, in literacy rates and in uh, cognitive potential. Okay, let's go on. And uh, it's reflected uh, very neatly in uh, uh, maps of cultural ach achievement. These maps are from uh, uh, Ch Charles Murray, the book Human Accomplishment. And uh, it shows um, 
uh, for each period uh, uh, the places uh, where uh, the most highly cited uh, uh, artists, uh, writers, musicians, and scientists came from. As you can see in 1400 to 1600, uh, this was, um, uh, you can see the major concentrations are in northern Italy and in uh, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, uh, if you recall a couple of slides back, uh, those are also the two regions with, with the by far the highest literacy rates. As you go on into the uh, era of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, uh, England starts becoming really prominent uh, just as uh, its, um, its uh, literacy rate begins to, uh, to uh, expand really rapidly, as does uh, southern, southern Germany, uh, the, the places of, the, uh, of where also Protestant uh, came and encouraged literacy. And uh, here, here you have this for 1800 uh, uh, to 1950. Same, same pattern. And uh, there was also uh, a pretty good correlation between uh, uh, book production per capita and uh, GDP per capita growth uh, uh, during uh, the period uh, once, once industrialism uh, start, went off going and Malthusian limits disappeared and uh, uh, people uh, people started getting richer. <coughs> so one frequently asked question is uh, why did the Industrial Revolution happen in, uh, in uh, Northwestern Europe and in England in particular? And uh, plenty of people have, have written about the topic that uh, as many explanations as, as there are uh, as there are historians who study uh, the problem, but one useful uh, way of, of looking at it, I think, is that uh, uh, simply uh, we have to bear in mind that from the middle of the 17th century, uh, England was a uh, was probably the world's first uh, 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 massively literate society. By the 18th century, 25% of households uh, had uh, uh, had books. Uh, and this was this. You had uh, people discussing the new industrial techniques that were coming along, and exchanging data on a scale that was um, uh, vastly greater than uh, what was uh, what was possible in antique societies with uh, uh, vastly dates were typically confined to uh, priestly elites or uh, aristocrats uh, who who, by the way, had had priorities in these the industrial societies. There was usually um, a, a sort of social discrimination against uh, people who, who involved themselves in manufactures, uh, and that stopped being the case in, uh, in England around this time. Of course, having, uh, having coal reserves helped as well. <coughs> yeah, I don't have time to explain. Right, and uh, another another uh, pretty big and important difference between England and uh, East Asia. So East Asia was actually, in some ways, uh, for that uh, pretty, pretty advanced in the 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, for instance, uh, they had higher life expectancy. They had uh, high average standards of medical care. They were really low, nonetheless, but uh, but still higher than in Europe. And they were also much more sanitary. Uh, than, than Europe. But ironically, what happened is that because of those uh, lower death rates, uh, people uh, um, could, uh, uh, the population uh, grew closer to the carrying capacity of the land. So on average, people had uh, less to eat there. And uh, nutrition is uh, pretty important to IQ, it's very important to IQ, in fact. And one result of this is that, uh, uh, is that, um, well, as you can see here, animal fats uh, throughout, I throughout English history uh, from, uh, constituted from 30 to 50 percent of calories consumed in Japan and India, and it's not shown here, but China as well. It only constituted uh, about 5 percent of consumed calories, the vast majority coming from uh, 
uh, from uh, um, grains. And uh, the, the animal product uh, calories are higher, higher, higher quality uh, for, for brain development and the development of intelligence. So not, not only was England more literate, but um, uh, they, they had better brain food. Okay, let's go on. So yeah, this was also, you can see, demonstrated in average heights. The average Japanese was 160 centimeters uh, tall in, uh, in the late 19th century, uh, the, uh, as was the average Indian, and in China it was only slightly, slightly higher, whereas the uh, English, the French, the Northern Italians, the Swedes were much higher. <coughs> yeah, a good nutrition obviously leads to greater height, so that's normal. Uh, so yeah, we... Uh, I've come to the end of this uh, historical um, uh, episode. Hope I've, uh, I've uh, shown that uh, that literacy and uh, and human capital was uh, pretty critical towards uh, human uh, technological and cultural development. At least they correlate really well. Uh, this is just we'll just quickly run through these slides. I'm also intelligence also contributes to to a better society, as you can see the. Um, uh, this this figure is from, from Charles Murray again, uh, the uh, clear clear distinction in the uh, uh, average average wealth and and IQ. Uh, from uh, uh, lesser chances of dropping out of high school. Actually, uh, as in all of these slides, uh, SES refers to the social economic status of the parents. Uh, so, as you can see, the IQ plays uh, a much greater role than the um, than who your parents are. Okay, what's going on? Same for getting a bachelor's degree. Uh, same for chances of being in poverty. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, at the end. Uh, Finally, uh, I'm going to come to the last part, which is uh, uh, prescriptions and effects on policy. And uh, through my research on, on, on this issue, I'm actually uh, planning to write a book on this. Uh, I've uh, identified uh, six uh, major major elements uh, that, that you need uh, to uh, maximize the level of intelligence uh, in a society. Uh, the first one is, of course, literacy, because without lit literacy, even if you are intelligent, it, uh, uh, you can't really use it effectively in a technological society, uh, where w which is uh, based on text. You can communicate much more with text and much more. Um, it's m much higher bandwidth than, than the line on speech, which, which you have to do if you're illiterate. Um, although uh, one one thing I would I would note is that uh, it's there's a um, uh, diminishing returns on on uh, further education. So literacy essential, uh, primary school extremely important, uh, uh, secondary school important, uh, university probably not so much. Uh, only uh, maybe 25 percent of the population really uh, benefits uh, from it. Um, the rest probably would be better off. Not not taking the debt and just uh, just taking taking the money. Uh, okay, could we move on. So yeah, this is uh, a picture of an of a, a Native American uh, when the Europeans arrived uh, uh, first arrived to the New World. They noted that they were really lean and muscular, um, but um, uh, they were actually better better fed than the Europeans. But uh, they were littered and uh, they got, uh, they got uh, uh, swept, swept aside. Okay. <coughs> okay. The second. Uh, can we go back to slides, please. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, one is uh, you need adequate nutrition, and uh, uh, if you've heard of the Flynn effect, it's the tendency for IQ to to increase over. Uh, over the decades, so actually, um, uh, 100 years ago, the average IQ levels in the U.S., for instance, were uh, from 15 to 25 points points lower than they are today. And uh, Flynn uh, uh, argued that um, uh, 
well, it's uh, uh, a puzzle where that where that comes from. But I think the major reason is uh, is there's two reasons uh, for why this happened. First, people started uh, uh, getting better fed, so malnutrition and in particular worms even were a problem in the United States uh, a century ago. Now uh, they are practically non-existent. So unfortunately, they uh, they're still a major issue in uh, India and Africa and some other third world countries. And handful policy in, in, uh, in particular has uh, has done some some good good work on uh, eradicating worms uh, in some uh, third world countries. And uh, the uh, one that thing about malnutrition in particular also applies to nutrient, particular nutrient deficiencies. Uh, there's several of them. There's zinc, there's magnesium, but the key one really, which is the most important one by far, is, uh, is iodine. Uh, so without uh, enough iodine, you get diseases like goiter. It also uh, substantially uh, lowers your, your IQ by, by 10 to 15 IQ points. Uh, the uh, introduction of uh, fortified uh, uh, salt with, with iodine in the United States in the 1920s was probably the single biggest and biggest bang for the bucks uh, intervention into raising IQ in, uh, in American history. Uh, this uh, uh, is, uh, we're getting into slightly politically incorrect territory here, but um, uh, intelligence is, all the studies show, hi highly heritable. Um, it estimates range from 40% to 80%, but most of them are converging towards the high end of that scale. And uh, uh, one, one thing we see is that historically, uh, in the, uh, um, in England at any date, there's evidence that uh, uh, during the late medieval period and early modern period in, in England, uh, wealthier people who on average uh, uh, were, could be expected to be more intelligent, uh, left, uh, uh, left more children uh, than, than average. This, uh, this comes from the book, uh, uh, Gregory, uh, uh, A uh, Farewell to Arms by Gregory, Gregory Clark, I highly recommend it. And uh, another, the extreme example of this is uh, uh, the development of Jewish Ashkenazi intelligence. Uh, so uh, the most learned Torah scholars got to marry the rabbi's daughter. The um, dumber half of the Jewish male population uh, went up and married the Gentiles who didn't marry at all. So what, what you had is a, uh, like a really rapid eugenic increase in, in Jewish intelligence uh, during during the Middle Ages and early modern period. But it's interesting stuff. I we don't have time to go into it in further detail right now. Uh, but um, today, uh, this tendency has uh, reversed itself uh, um, one by 180 degrees. Uh, so uh, this, this is a, um, there was a big study in the uh, American population uh, the IQ test they used was pretty simple. Uh, the n number of uh, percentage of words out of 10 that uh, people could correctly uh, define. But it's, it has a good correlation with IQ. And uh, they also asked a variety of, of questions of them in addition to this, uh, such as uh, uh, the um, like life questions, and in particular, uh, one of the questions they asked is how, how many children they had. And uh, uh, as, as you can see, the, the, it's, um, uh, the premise of the movie Idi Idiocracy is, is actually true. Uh, on average, uh, intelligent people aren't only having uh, fewer children on average, but, uh, the average uh, uh, but the average age at which they have them is, uh, is considerably higher than uh, those of uh, less intelligent people. And, uh, it's not going to have major consequences uh, in a decade or two, in a half a century, or especially a century, probably will. Um, okay. Yeah, that's uh, from the poster for that movie. And this is the, uh, the graph on the left shows the IQ bell curve for a Chinese vi uh, village which was found to be iodine deficient and the Chinese village, which was iodine sufficient. So as you can see, that's a pretty major difference. That's uh, uh, 15, 15 IQ points. 
So wh one good thing about it is that sometimes relatively easy interventions can make a, a huge, huge differences, and uh, these low-hanging fruits should be uh, people should really focus on on uh, picking them up because they are uh, a lot uh, uh, cheap and easy to implement in some advanced learning programs, and at least do them do them first. Okay. <coughs> Another major, major um, negative impact uh, on IQ is uh, 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 inbreeding. And it's uh, actually the incidence of consang so-called consanguineous marriage. Uh, that's uh, when a, a father's brother's daughter, for instance, uh, my father's brother's daughter, I marry her. That's actually quite common in the uh, Muslim world, unfortunately. And uh, it's, it um, leads, uh, there's a clear correlation between that and uh, declines in IQ. The IQ scale is the one on the left. Uh, the incidence of consanguineous uh, marriage is, uh, is the scale on the bottom. And uh, that should, should really be stamped out, but unfortunately it, it goes against some, some social mores. So there's, there's, there's difficulties in that. <coughs> The, the one advantage of the PISA test is that it also uh, had had some data on uh, the scores of uh, of natives in different countries uh, uh, relative to immigrants, and uh, those are the gaps. Again, uh, politically incorrect, but um, one uh, uh, one um, way to, if not raise IQ, but but to forestall decline is to have a uh, uh, more vigorous or selective uh, immigration policies like what you have in Canada, Australia, or Singapore. <coughs> well, that was gloomy. Um, now on to some, some futurist, uh, transhumanist, optimistic stuff. Uh, so maybe all of that stuff um, um, won't really be necessary if uh, the uh, Panglossian scenarios of uh, progress and uh, uh, and the self-improvement come to pass. Uh, this is from the video game DSX Human Revolution. Uh, it's set in 2027, and people uh, get uh, augments uh, like uh, super strong arms and uh, super strong legs and uh, bulletproof skin. And among other things, you see that chip he has on his head. Uh, that's uh, shows his, um, uh, that allows him to hack things quickly. Uh, you can imagine scenarios in which you could have a, some extra memory there or like a, a, C, like a CPU or something that, that accelerates your, your thinking process. Uh, in which case, uh, some of the more pessimistic or politically incorrect consequences identified earlier might, might not be necessary if we really start uh, uh, devel quickly developing these augmentation and uh, uh, technologies and biotechnologies to, to improve humanity. Yeah, that's, uh, that's my talk. So I think we have time for